Excuse me. Well, good morning and uh, a warm welcome to your service. It's good to see you here. Uh, just let me run through the announcements uh, as normal. Uh, we meet for prayer in the Nelson Room this evening at 6.30 before the service of worship at 7. Uh, then uh, tea and coffee will be served after the evening service again. Uh, the Congregational Committee has agreed to hold a work night uh, tomorrow night starting at 7 o'clock and the plan is to uh, clean and tidy the car park. Uh, tidy the trees and bushes, uh, power wash the front steps and move some of the, st the chairs out of the, the Baird Hall and we also want to identify items which are no longer needed so that they can be recycled or dumped so uh, do please join us and, and help us with that if you can uh, the more people we have the easier it is and our organization leaders have already been asked to identify what items can be set aside for disposal. Uh, the Kirk session, it's going to meet on Tuesday then uh, at 7.30. Uh, normally it meets on Monday, but because of the work night, we've moved that meeting to Tuesday. And the midweek Bible study and prayer meeting for all the congregation is on Wednesday at 7.45. Again, let me encourage you to join us for that. The last open air meeting will be held uh, this Saturday at 2 o'clock. Uh, so meet at the corner of Crimea Street and the Shankle Road on Saturday at 2 o'clock. Uh, the work to refurbish the, the foyer and the halls uh, is due to start on Monday the 30th of May and it's uh, likely to take four weeks uh, just so you, you know about that and access to the halls will be uh, extremely limited during that time. Uh, please add your name to the car park route and the reception route in the vestibule if you're able to help with uh, either of those and uh, please also add your name to the schedule in the vestibule if you'd like to take part in the Sunday services by leading in prayer or doing the Bible reading. And the annual general report uh, for 2021 is now available on the church website. Uh, so you can read it on the website, you can download it, but uh, let me know if you don't have access to the internet and we'd like a copy and we can arrange that for you. I think those are all the announcements I need to mention just now. We're here to worship God and in the Psalms it says our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. And let's uh, praise God together by standing to sing uh, Psalm 130, Lord from the depths of I call to you.
pray. And Heavenly Father, we uh, bow before you and we humble ourselves in your presence because you're the only God, the everlasting God, the God who is perfect in every way, the God who is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in your being and wisdom and power and holiness and justice and goodness and truth. There is none like you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God we worship and adore. We give thanks to you, Father, for sending your Son into the world to deliver us from our sin and misery by his life and death and resurrection on our behalf. And we give thanks to you for sending your Spirit into our lives to enable us to repent and to believe the good news. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins and for the hope of everlasting life in your presence. We thank you for the church and for the fellowship of your people and for the opportunity to gather in your presence Sunday by Sunday to hear your word and all your promises to us. And we thank you that you're the one who hears us when we cry out to you for mercy and for grace. We confess, Heavenly Father, that we're sinners who sin against you continually and we need your mercy and your grace. From our childhood until this very hour, we have sinned against your law by our sinful thoughts and words and desires and deeds which are too many to count. We haven't loved you as we should with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength and we haven't loved our neighbor as ourselves. And so we now repent of our sins and we ask uh, that you will not treat us as our sins deserve. Do not repay us according to our iniquity. Instead, will you treat us according to your mercy and will you forgive us our sins for the sake of Christ who died for us? And will you help us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions? And to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives while we wait for our Savior to come again. And Heavenly Father, will you help us to worship you today? Help us to give thanks to you in our prayers and our praise. Help us to listen to the reading and preaching of your word. Will you minister to each one of us according to our need? And uh, will you fill us with zeal for the glory of your name? so that we might always declare your praises. And we ask it all in our Savior's name. Amen. And uh, having confessed our sins, hear the good news from Psalm 130. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem his people from all their iniquities. Amen. And we thank God for his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I wonder if there are any boys and girls here. Do you want to come down to the front of the, the church and, and, and meet me here? Oh, great. Yes. Super. Well, there's Jack. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, brilliant. Okay. All oh, right. Okay, there's, a, there's quite a few now. Super. Okay. Good to see you then. Um, I forgot my clicker. Hang on. Good to see you. Uh, we're thinking about Jeremiah. We've been talking about Jeremiah uh, for a wee while. Uh, Jeremiah, do you remember he was a prophet? So he was a preacher. It was his job to preach to the people and tell them God's word. And uh, the people were very wicked in those days. And often they didn't listen to God. They didn't keep his commandments and they didn't worship God. Sometimes they worshiped other gods. And so God sent uh, Jeremiah to preach to them and say, stop doing wrong, start doing right, come back to the Lord. Uh, but the people didn't listen. And so um, God did what he warned his people uh, about. He sent their enemies in to invade the land. Uh, so there are the enemies there, the Babylonians from uh, the nation of Babylon, which is a mighty nation, and the people there were mighty soldiers. They invaded the land, you see, and with the horses and chariots, and they went uh, up to Jerusalem, and they, they besieged Jerusalem. Do you know what it means to besiege a city? 
Any ideas? What do you do if you're besieging a city? You stop the people in the city from getting out and you don't let anybody get into the city. So maybe, you know, you surround the city and you make sure no one gets out and no one can get in. And you, can you think why they would do that to a city? Why would they stop people getting into the city and people getting out of the city? Any ideas? Well, it meant that no one was able to come in with food. So uh, if they waited long enough, eventually the people in the city would start to get very, very hungry and they'd start to starve. And very often then they would give themselves up, they'd surrender because they, they were so hungry. And so here's a picture of what it was like. Here's a wee uh, child crying, crying because there's no food in, uh, in, in the child's bowl. And everybody's looking a bit miserable because the Babylonians were laying siege to Jerusalem. The people had no food and they thought, what's going to happen to us? They were getting hungrier and hungrier. Well, God sent Jeremiah to uh, preach again to the people. And this time he said something really odd. He said to them, whoever stays in the city will end up dying. The Babylonians will come and kill you. But if you surrender to the Babylonians, you'll live. So if you stay and try to save your life, you'll die, you'll be killed. But if you surrender, you'll live. And that's what he said. And some people listened to Jeremiah and said, well, hang on, this isn't a very good message. You're discouraging the people. Instead of, you know, giving us hope and saying, yes, we're going to beat the Babylonians. Yes, we're going to win a great victory. You're saying we have to surrender. That's not good. And so some of the people who uh, didn't like what Jeremiah was saying, they took hold of him and uh, they put him in a pit. So do you see here, it's probably something like an old well in the ground and they lowered him down in ropes and you can see Jeremiah is an old man and uh, they lowered him down into this pit into this well and at the bottom of the pit it was all mud and Jeremiah began to sink down into the mud would you like to do that would you like to be in a pit sinking in the mud no you wouldn't well it, Jeremiah didn't like it either uh, but there was a man called uh, Ibed Melech and he wasn't from Jerusalem, he wasn't from Israel, he was from a foreign country called Ethiopia, but he was in Jeremiah, or he was in Jerusalem, and he saw what had happened to Jeremiah. He looked down into the pit, and he could see him there sinking into the, the mud, and uh, he said, I must do something. So he went to the king, and he went to the king, and he said, listen, it's not right what they've done to Jeremiah. They put him in a pit. He's sinking down into the mud, and he'll starve if you leave him there. That's not good. We have to get him out of there. And so the king said to Abed-Melech, well, yes, you can do then what you want. And he gathered his men, and they again threw down some ropes, and uh, they raised Jeremiah up out of the pit so that he was, uh, he was able to live instead of dying at the bottom of the pit. So uh, it was a good escape for Jeremiah. Well now, uh, what happened to Jeremiah is similar to what happened to the Lord Jesus many years later, because Jeremiah was a preacher, wasn't he? And he preached, oh, you know, stop doing wrong, come back to God. If you keep doing wrong, God's going to punish you. And that's what the Lord Jesus did. He went to Jerusalem, the same city, and he said to the people, oh, if you stop doing wrong, uh, you, you must stop doing wrong. And if you don't, God is going to punish you. Stop doing wrong. Uh, otherwise, God is going to punish you. So Jeremiah was a preacher, and so was the Lord Jesus. And then many of the people didn't like what uh, Jeremiah was saying. And many of the people didn't like what Jesus was saying whenever he was here. Lots of people wanted to put their fingers in their ears and stop listening to him because they didn't believe the things that he was saying. Some of the people put Jeremiah down into a pit so that he would die. And you know what happened to the Lord Jesus, didn't you? When he went to Jer Jerusalem, the people didn't listen. They didn't like what he was saying. And they put him to death. So that he went down into a pit, he went into the grave, and his body lay there, and he was dead for three days. And then, of course, Jeremiah was raised up out of the pit, and three days after Jesus was put in the grave, 
he was raised up to new life, resurrection life. And so what happened to Jeremiah is similar to what happened to the Lord Jesus. And just as everybody should have listened to Jeremiah, so everybody should listen to the Lord Jesus. Because he's the one who says, yes, stop doing wrong and believe in me and you can have eternal life with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the way that you rescued Jeremiah from the pit all those years ago. And we thank you especially for the way you raised your son from the grave. And uh, he was able to come out of the grave triumphant and live forever. And we pray that you'd help us always to believe what the Lord Jesus says and to trust in him as the only saviour of the world. Help us to trust in him so that we might have forgiveness and eternal life with you. And we pray this in our Savior's name. Amen. Great. Do you want to go back to your seats and we'll sing the, the next song, um, which is, I think, There Are Hundreds of Sparrows. Children want to go out to uh, children's chairs now. Let's uh, turn to God in prayer again with our prayers of intercession. Let's pray. And Almighty God, in our prayers of intercession this morning, we pray uh, for the nations of the world. And we pray for people throughout the world who are suffering today because of poverty and hunger or because of uh, natural disasters. And we ask that you'll have mercy upon them and send them relief from all of their troubles. We pray especially for the people of Ukraine, and we ask that you'll have mercy on them and bring the war to an end, and will you provide the people in Ukraine with all that they need. We pray too that you'll bring good out of this war, and that many will turn to Christ for peace with you, and for the hope of everlasting life in a new and better world to come. We pray for the extension of Christ's kingdom throughout the world. We ask that you'll send out uh, preachers into the mission fields to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ and his life and death and resurrection for sinners. We pray for those missionaries who have already gone out and who are serving you overseas, and we ask that you'll protect them from all evil. And we ask that you'd help them to remain faithful to you and not to become discouraged by disappointments and setbacks. We ask that through their efforts and their witness, many men and women and boys and girls will believe the good news and be added to your church throughout the world. We pray for the last open air meeting this coming Saturday. 
We ask that you'll help uh, us to proclaim the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, that people will stop and listen and that you'll open their hearts to pay attention to the message and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, for this church. Uh, we ask that you'll build us up in holiness and comfort as we meet together week by week that we be renewed more and more in the likeness of your Son, that you would always comfort us with the knowledge of your love and your faithfulness. We pray for those who are unwell or receiving treatment. Help them to remain strong in the faith and to keep trusting in your unfailing goodness. Help any who are bereaved and missing their loved ones. Will you reassure them of your loving faithfulness? Help any who are in danger of going astray and wandering from Christ the Savior. We pray that you'll keep them from wandering from the narrow path that leads to everlasting life in your presence, that you'll keep them from stumbling and falling away from Christ the Lord. We remember those who are sitting exams in school and college at the moment, and we ask you to help them to look to you for the help they need to do their best, and will you help them to know that their times are in your hands and that they can always trust in you, their faithful Father. Lord, will you hear these in all of our prayers, for we ask them in our Savior's name. Amen. If you've got a Bible, please uh, turn with me to uh, Ruth chapter 3. So after the first uh, five books of the Bible, um, then you've got Joshua, Judges, Ruth. And if you're, you're, after that is 1 and 2 Samuel, so you should, hopefully you'll find Ruth. And uh, we're in chapter 3, and this is the word of the Lord. One day, Naomi, uh, her mother-in-law, that's Ruth's mother-in-law, said to Ruth, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Uh, is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Today, tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor and don't let him know you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Uh, Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem you, good, let him redeem. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you're wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. 
for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Amen, and we thank God for his word to us this morning. Let's pray for a moment. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So uh, previously in the book of Ruth, uh, Elimelech, a man from Bethlehem, set out with his wife Naomi and their two sons to go to the land of Moab because there was a famine in the land of Israel. While they were in Moab, Elimelech died, leaving his wife and two sons. The two sons married Moabite women, and uh, then the two sons died, leaving Naomi with her two daughters-in-law. When Naomi heard that the famine in Israel was over, she decided to return to Bethlehem. Her daughters-in-law set off with her, but on the journey, uh, she turned to them and tried to persuade them that they should return to Moab. There was no way she could provide them with uh, other husbands, and their best chance of marriage was in Moab. Uh, and they needed to, rem to remarry, didn't they? And in those days, there was no social security, there were no pensions. If a woman didn't have a husband to support her or children to look after her in her uh, old age, then she could end up destitute. So they needed to remarry. One of them, Orpah, was convinced by what Naomi said, and she went back. But the other one, Ruth, refused to leave. She said, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. So she bound herself to Naomi, and more importantly, she bound herself to Naomi's God. Instead of choosing to return to the dead idols of Moab, she chose the living God of Israel. When they arrived back in Bethlehem, Naomi said to the people who remembered her from before, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant, but call me Mara, which means bitter, because I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me pleasant? Because the Lord has afflicted me and he's brought misfortune on me. And of course, Naomi didn't know why the Lord had afflicted her, but, but we know because we know how the story ends and how the Lord was working all things together for Naomi's good and for Ruth's good and for our good as well because the story of Naomi and Ruth is connected to the even greater story of Jesus Christ our Savior who according to his human nature was descended from Ruth. In the second chapter Ruth went out to glean in the fields so in those days, the poor were allowed to go into the fields and pick up any of the barley or wheat which had been dropped during the harvest. Uh, in this way, the Lord provided for uh, the needs of the poor. And it just so happened that Ruth ended up in the field of a man called Boaz, who was related to Naomi by marriage. And Boaz was very kind to Ruth, wasn't he? He allowed her to gather in his field and told her not to go elsewhere. He made sure his men didn't bother her, and when it was time uh, for a meal, he invited her to sit with his servants and eat the meal which had been prepared, and he invited her to drink from his water jars, and he even told his men to drop some barley deliberately for her to pick up. And so at the end of Ruth's first day in the field, she managed to gather a sack load of grain for herself and her mother-in-law. Who was this man, Boaz, who showed Ruth so much kindness? Well, Naomi knew who he was. In fact, she knew what he was. He was one of their kinsmen redeemers. In those days, the kinsman redeemer was responsible for delivering the members of his family from trouble. And so, who knows? Uh, perhaps Boaz was the answer to all of their problems. And so we come to the third part of this short story. And in this chapter, Naomi sends Ruth to the threshing floor to uh, speak to Boaz in the middle of the night. According to verse 1, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Ruth, uh, that she thinks she, uh, Naomi, should try to find a home for Ruth where she'll be well provided for. Uh, resting place is perhaps a better translation of what she said since uh, Ruth was a, a widow 
and had no one to provide for her. She had no rest because she was always having to think about how to make a living and how to get enough food for herself and for Naomi. And so Naomi wanted uh, Ruth to find a resting place. She wanted to find Ruth a home with a husband to support her so she wouldn't need to uh, worry anymore about how she would survive. And it's clear from verse 2 that she thinks Boaz is the, the right man for Ruth to marry. Uh, the NIV doesn't include it, but uh, the Hebrew text uh, uses the word behold. So she's saying, behold, look, this is your chance. This is your chance because Boaz will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor tonight. Uh, winning, winnowing involved uh, crushing the grain and tossing it into the air. And the wind would blow away the useless chaff while the kernels of grain would uh, fall to the ground to be collected. So uh, now's your chance to have a quiet word with Boaz. Uh, so wash yourself, uh, put on your perfume. And while the NIV says that Naomi instructed uh, Ruth to put on her best clothes, the Hebrew text doesn't say anything about best clothes. Naomi merely told her to put on a garment. Uh, now, some of the, the commentators, some of the, the Bible scholars uh, with overactive imaginations think Naomi is telling Ruth to put on her best dress because she wants Ruth to seduce Boaz in the night. But at least one commentator suggests that up until now, uh, Ruth may have been wearing mourning clothes. Uh, in that case, what Naomi is saying to her is that it's time to bring her time of mourning for her husband to an end. So put away all those dark mourning clothes and uh, put on your normal clothes again so that Boaz will know that you're ready for marriage. King David did something similar in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12 after the death of his son. In that chapter, we're told that he washed himself, he put on lotions or perfume, and he got dressed to show that the time for mourning had come to an end. And it seems that's what Naomi was telling Ruth to do. And Naomi then instructed Ruth to go down to the threshing floor. Uh, don't show yourself to him immediately, but, but wait until he's finished eating and lies down. And uh, note carefully the place where he's lying, uh, she said. Uh, since it was nighttime and there were presumably other men uh, sleeping at the threshing floor, Ruth didn't want to make a mistake and end up lying next to the wrong person. So note carefully where he's lying and then go and uncover his feet and uh, lie down. Again, some of the commentators with an overactive imagination suggest that Naomi is telling uh, Ruth to seduce Boaz. But uh, if you've got your Bible open, look, look back to verse 22 of chapter 2, where it says that Ruth reported to Naomi that Boaz had told her to remain in his fields. And Naomi replied, that's a good idea, because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. You know, some man might attack you and abuse you, take advantage of you. So back in chapter 2, Naomi was concerned for Ruth's well-being and safety. Uh, she didn't want her to come to any harm. So it doesn't seem likely that she would now want Ruth to give up all modesty and to seduce this man. But why then did Ruth tell, uh, or why then did, did she, uh, Naomi tell Ruth that she should uncover Boaz's feet? Well, what happens to you in the night if uh, your feet are uncovered? You wake up, don't you, in the middle of the night. You feel cold, a chill, and you wake up and you sort out your duvet or your blankets or whatever. And so that's what was happening here. She was uncovering his feet and exposing them to the cool uh, night air. And so the feet would get cold and he would wake up in the night. And then Naomi says, he will tell you what to do. And Ruth listens to her mother-in-law and agrees to do what she says. Uh, 
And according to verse 6, she went down to the threshing floor and did everything Naomi told her to do. And so when Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went off to a far corner to lie down for the night. Uh, some of the commentators think that he may have been drunk and that this was again part of Naomi's plan for Ruth to seduce him, but I think they're reading too much into the phrase in good spirits. It simply means he was feeling good after a hard day's work and a tasty meal. Ruth then approached him quietly and covered his feet to the cool night air, and then she lay down and waited for him to wake up. And sure enough, in the middle of the night, uh, something uh, startled him. Perhaps it should be he shivered. Uh, so he shivered in the night because his feet were cold. And he turned, presumably, to rearrange his blanket. And that's when he found a woman lying uh, beside his feet. It was dark, of course, and so uh, he wasn't able to see uh, Ruth clearly, and he didn't know then who this woman was. So he asked her to identify herself, and she replied in verse 9 that she was his servant Ruth, and she then asked him to spread the corner of his garment over her. Again, those commentators with an overactive imagination think she's asking him to, to let her sleep with him. But in those days, the phrase to spread your garment over someone meant that you were proposing marriage. I'm not sure people still do it uh, today, but in the past, when two people were getting married, you might say they're getting hitched, hitched together in marriage. Uh, that's what we used to say. Well, in those days, uh, spreading your garment over somebody meant uh, you were going to get married. So Ruth was proposing marriage to Boaz. Her time of mourning was now over, and she was ready to remarry. And she wanted Boaz to be the one. And the reason she had chosen Boaz is because he's her kinsman redeemer. Uh, do you see that at the end of verse 9? As I've already said, the kinsman redeemer was a relative who was responsible for delivering his family from trouble. And so since he was their kinsman redeemer, Ruth wanted Boaz to marry her to deliver Ruth and Naomi from their poverty and from an uncertain future. And look how Boaz responds. He blesses her, and he speaks of uh, her kindness to him. Um, and her kindness, he says, it's greater than her earlier kindness. So he's referring to her kindness to Naomi. Because instead of abandoning Naomi, uh, Ruth had stayed with Naomi and remained committed to her. And having shown kindness to Naomi, she was now showing even greater kindness to Boaz. And he goes on to explain what he, what he meant by that. Uh, now that the time of her mourning was over, she could, have had, she could have gone after the younger men in Bethlehem. He mentions rich and poor, so uh, he means she could have gone after anybody she wanted. And uh, she was known around Bethlehem. Uh, as a woman of noble character, so there may have been other men who were interested in her. And yet she had chosen him, Boaz. And so he praises her for her kindness. And perhaps he's not only referring to her kindness to him in, in choosing him to be her husband, but also her kindness to Naomi. Because marrying Boaz uh, will not only mean security for Ruth, but it'll also mean security for Naomi as well. Naomi won't need to worry about the future because Boaz and Ruth will be able to look after her. But there's a problem, isn't there? Uh, and we'll hear about the problem, uh, or more about the problem next uh, week. But the problem is, although he's a kinsman redeemer, uh, there's another kinsman redeemer who is closer to them than Boaz. So that's in verse 12. So they had a closer relative than Boaz, and uh, the other man may wish to redeem them. And he would then have the right to do so, because he's a closer relative. So stay here for the night, he tells her, and in the morning, if this other man wants to redeem you, well, fair enough. Uh, if not, I will certainly do it. But uh, I'll not leave you stuck. I'll not abandon you. I'll make sure that your future is secure one way or another. I'll do it myself or this other person will do it. And so uh, Ruth lay down at his feet until morning, but she got up early 
uh, before anyone might see her and uh, start rumors around Bethlehem. Before she leaves, Boaz fills her shawl with six measures or six handfuls of barley and she returned to her home and told Naomi everything Boaz had done for her. And she added, he even gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. And the words, and the words empty-handed recall Naomi's complaint at the end of chapter 1 where she said she had gone away from Bethlehem full, but she'd returned to Bethlehem empty. But she's not empty now, and it's because of the kindness of Boaz. And the chapter ends with Naomi saying to Ruth, that Boaz will not rest until the matter is settled today. So that's the chapter. And uh, this whole book, as we've been learning, is about God's uh, providence, isn't it? It's about how God controls and directs all of his creatures and all of their actions. Nothing happens by chance, but everything happens according to his will. And we, we've seen this before, haven't we? In chapter 1, Naomi said not to call her pleasant but bitter because the Lord had afflicted her. Uh, why had the Lord afflicted her? Well, it's because he was working out his plan to bring Ruth to Bethlehem so that she could meet and marry Boaz because God had planned that Jesus Christ, our Savior, would be descended from Ruth and Boaz. Yes, Naomi's life had become bitter, but it hadn't happened by chance because God had sent these afflictions upon her as part of his plan for the salvation of the world. And then in chapter 2, we read that as it turned out, as it turned out, Ruth ended up in the field of Boaz. And the author made it sound as if it had happened by chance. So she happened to end up in that field by chance she ended up in that field. As luck would have it, she ended up in that field. But nothing happens by chance, but by God's design. Uh, God is a great designer so that everything that happens in the world happens according to his will. He plans it all. And so he planned that Ruth would come to the field and meet Boaz. And we can discern God's hand in the events of today's chapter uh, when Boaz uh, shivered and woke in the night, he could so easily have reacted differently, couldn't he? Uh, after all, uh, I'm sure it was a shock to his system to find Ruth lying there. And so he could have shouted out an alarm, uh, or he might have thought that she was up to no good. Uh, those commentators who think that Naomi sent Ruth to seduce Boaz have misunderstood uh, her intentions, but it seems that in those days there were uh, prostitutes who would gather at the threshing floor in the night. And so Boaz could have assumed that's what, that, that Ruth was one of them. And being a righteous man, he may have just sent her away. But he doesn't send her away. And he doesn't shout out an alarm. He was prepared to listen to her and find out what she wanted. And then when he found out what she wanted, he could so easily have refused. After all, who was Ruth? She was a Moabitess and he was an Israelite. So she was a foreigner, an outsider. So why would he be prepared to listen to her, let alone contemplate marriage with her? And uh, it was very unusual uh, for a woman to propose marriage to a man. It didn't normally happen. It's, it's the same today. It maybe happens more often these days. But in those days, it was unheard of. And uh, he was a man of standing in the community where she was virtually destitute. So there was little reason for him to listen to her, let alone agree to marry her. And yet, remarkably, he was prepared to do everything Ruth suggested. So why, why was he prepared to do what she asked? Well, Boaz was clearly a, a kind man. We have amp, ample evidence of that uh, in the past. But it was also because the Lord was working out his plans for Ruth and Boaz and Naomi. Uh, in the book of Proverbs, it says that the king's heart is a stream of water. 
in the hand of the Lord and he turns it wherever he will. And uh, if the Lord is able to turn and direct the heart of the king so that the king does what God wants, then God is able to turn and direct the heart of every person, including Boaz, so that Boaz did what was necessary to fulfill God's plan for him. And we ought to remember this uh, when we, we go about our daily lives. Here's a person who said no to me. Uh, well, why was it? Is that person just being difficult? Well, perhaps that person is just being difficult. But if that's the only explanation we have, then we're likely to complain, aren't we? Here's another person who said yes to me. Why was it? Is that person just being kind? Well, perhaps uh, she was just being kind. But if that's the only explanation we have, then the only person we think of thanking is the person who said yes to us. But we also need to remember that God is working out his plans for us through these people and through what they say to us and what they do to us. And so when things go well for us, we should remember to give thanks to God for his kindness to us. Because didn't he enable this person who said yes to us to treat us favorably? And when things go against us, uh, we should submit to God's will for us. Because nothing happens by chance but according to his design. And it was God's will for this person to say no to us. And while we may not understand why the Lord does what he does, we believe that he is good and that his plans for his people are good. And so this chapter, like the previous one, is about God's providence and how he directs all things that happen in the world. But then let's also think about Boaz again in this, his role as kinsman redeemer. Uh, just look at his kindness to Ruth and his willingness to do what she asked and to deliver her from her misery by marrying her. And even before Ruth leaves to go home, he fills her shawl with grain as a sign of how he intends to take away their emptiness and to fill their lives with good. And therefore, uh, Boaz foreshadows the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our kinsman redeemer. As I said last week, the Lord Jesus is our kinsman because even though he's the eternal son of God, he took to himself our human nature and became one of us. So he became our kinsman, our, our relative. And he became our relative in order to deliver us from our misery. So if it were not for Boaz... Ruth's future was bleak, but because of his willingness to marry her, her future became bright because she had someone to look after her who would fill her life with good. And if it were not for Christ, our kinsman redeemer, uh, your future would be bleak. In fact, it would be worse than bleak because all of us deserve God's wrath and curse in this life and the next for all that we have done wrong. And so there would be nothing for you to hope for in this world or in the next. But because of Christ who paid for our sins with his life, we are pardoned by God through faith in him. And we can look forward to everlasting life in God's presence where there's fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. And he not only delivers us from misery in the life to come, but he delivers us from our misery in this life because through uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can come to God in prayer to seek his help for this life's troubles and trials. Because of Christ, we have peace with God and we can rely on him for his gracious help each day. But there's a big difference uh, between Boaz and the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't there? Of course, there are two big differences. Uh, the first is that while Boaz was willing to deliver Ruth and Naomi from a bleak future by marrying Ruth, the Lord Jesus was willing to deliver us from a bleak future by dying for us on the cross. So that's the first big difference. But the second big difference is that, that Ruth had to go to Boaz. She went to meet him, she woke him, she spoke to him, she proposed marriage to him. She took the initiative 
And he responded to her. But the Lord Jesus Christ came to us. Uh, there's the hymn we sometimes sing, the church is one foundation, and it says in the first verse, the church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ the Lord, she is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. So the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, left the glory of heaven, and he came down to earth in order to, to seek and to save the people who make up his church. Before we loved him or knew anything about him, he loved us, and he came into the world to save us. Ruth had to go to Boaz, whereas the Lord Jesus Christ came to us. And he also comes to us Sunday by Sunday in the preaching of his word. And it's as if he holds out his arms to us and he invites us, he commands us to come to him for rest, for rest. And the way we come to him for rest is by trusting in him as the only savior of the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do praise you because we know that you are the great designer, the one who has planned all things, and that every day you're working out your plans for us and for the world. And so, Lord God, help us to give thanks to you when, uh, when things work out for us, and when things are difficult, Lord God, help us to submit to your will for us and to continue to believe that your will for us is good, even though we may not understand it. And we do thank you that Christ, uh, our kinsman redeemer, did not wait for us to come to him, but he came to us. He left the glory of heaven. He came down to earth as one of us to suffer and die, to die on the cross, to pay for our sins and to deliver us from our sin and misery that we might have eternal life in your presence. And so help us always to trust in him and to give thanks to you for him. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's uh, stand to sing all my days.
forth. In the name of the Lord, this is God's charge. Uh, we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.